WCW Slamboree 1997 took place in the Independence Arena in Charlotte, North Carolina on May 18th, 1997. Just under 10,000 fans showed up for the event and an estimated 220,000 homes bought the show on pay-per-view. There's no WCW Championship match tonight in the main event, instead the original Wolfpack consisting of Scott Hall, Kevin Nash and Six are gonna face Ric Flair, Kevin Green and Roddy Piper in a no disqualification match. Flair has been out injured since September of 1996 so this is his big return match. We have 9 matches to look at today so let's get started with the TV title bout featuring Steven Regal in Ultimo Dragon. Regal said on Nitro that he's throwing away his nobility and bringing back the grappler who fought in England as a young lad, beating guys twice his age at Blackpool Pleasure Beach in the 80s. He has his hands full tonight though because Ultimo Dragon has been having some seriously good matches recently. He's been a highlight of WCW programming for sure over these past 6 months or so. It's all about gaining risk control to start this one off as Mike Tanay says Dragon will have to approach this match differently. Dragon brings Regal down and an armbar gets applied but Regal quickly counters with a head scissors submission. A test of strength follows and Regal throws Dragon to the mat after Dragon bridges out but Regal manages to cross Dragon's arms over his neck and we see a modified surfboard stretch. Regal then performs a tilt the world slam and he then decides to stomp on Dragon's head. So far Regal has been completely in control. The TV champion then comes back with a shoulder block, Dragon then moves into a side headlock and Regal goes down after a drop kick. Regal tries to put an end to Dragon's offensive flurry with a boot to the head but Dragon replies with a drop to hold. Regal then gets confused when the champ shows off his balance on the top rope and the challenger gets kicked away. And then we see Dragon's signature kick combination, the final kick hits Regal right on the throat. Regal then takes a few hard kicks to the back, Dragon gets a little vicious here and Regal finds himself in a half crab but he makes it to the ropes. A neckbreaker from Ultimo Dragon gets followed up with a head scissors and when Regal fails to counter with a Regal stretch, he too ends up getting a little vicious and Dragon takes a ton of kicks on the mat. Dragon has to take some time on the outside to regain composure. Regal hits a suplex, the two competitors trade full Nelson locks. Regal slaps Dragon after once again failing to lock in the Regal stretch and Dragon retaliates with a few slaps of his own. This gets the crowd making a little noise. An armbar from Dragon gets countered with another failed attempt at a Regal stretch but Regal does manage to pull off a bow and arrow. Dragon then gets out of a chin lock by batting down on Regal's forearm. And then we see the Muda lock from Ultimo Dragon before he moves into a crossface camel clutch. This has been a great match with a very different pace than normal, submission fans shouldn't sleep on this one. Dragon counters a backdrop and Regal gets drop kicked out of the ring. Sonny Ono kicks Regal on the outside and Dragon actually doesn't look too happy with his manager here. Dragon then performs a top rope Frankensteiner, Regal kicks out. Dragon goes for a moonsault but Regal moves out of the way and Regal once again fails to apply the Regal stretch. Frustrated, Regal goes for a double underhook suplex but it's countered with another Frankensteiner. The fight goes to the outside again where Regal casually walks away from a plancha, I love this. But Dragon's able to hit the Asai moonsault and Regal is now in trouble. Oh no, once again begins kicking Regal but when Dragon throws Regal back in the ring, Ono oh kicks Dragon. The commentators say this was unintentional but it sure didn't look like it was. Regal takes advantage, we see an inverted suplex and Regal finally applies the Regal stretch to become a 4 time TV champion. WCW simply can't be beat with their opening pay per view matches, this was another great underrated opening contest that has the potential to be match of the night. Looks like Sonny Ono is now done with Ultimo Dragon 2. 
Medusa vs Luna Vachon was up next and there's a few problems here. First of all, WCW waited way too long before having this match. And secondly, the rivalry hasn't been given any TV time at all. Luna attacked Medusa twice over the course of a couple of months. Maybe there was something that was stopping Medusa and Luna showing up on TV, but yeah. The commentators say that Medusa defeated WCW Women's Champion Akira Hokoto in Japan, and Medusa should be the Women's Champion, but apparently Sonny Ono says that the match never happened. There's some controversy surrounding the championship here, but why care about it? The championship belt is seen again on WCW very soon before it's totally forgotten about, but we'll get to all that soon on Reliving the War. Luna and Medusa are given 5 minutes here that goes by very quickly after the 16 minute TV title match. It's all Luna to start off with. Medusa gets an opening after nailing a spinning heel kick but Luna comes right back with a chokehold. An impressive hook clothesline from Medusa brings her right back into the match. Luna misses a top rope splash as WCW advertised their website, and Medusa gets the win with her signature German suplex. A decent match in the ring, but no one really had an investment in the rivalry, it seemed to be an afterthought. Randy Savage then shows up, he takes a microphone away from Mean Gene Okerlund and he heads to the ring to cut a promo. While putting over members of the NWO, Randy gets interrupted by fans chanting DDP. Savage says Paige doesn't want none of the macho madness anymore, but Dallas shows up to prove Savage wrong. Dallas is holding Savage's crutch, a crutch Hogan used to attack DDP on Nitro. Savage quickly gets out of the ring and Eric Bischoff has to hold Randy back. Eric calls for the troops and out comes the NWO mid-carters. DDP decides to bait Savage back in the ring by saying the macho man has to go to Hogan's house to clean his car and kiss his ass. Randy tells the NWO to step aside and the macho man ends up getting in the ring and getting destroyed with the crutch. Paige takes out Bagwell, Vincent and Eric Bischoff as the crowd goes absolutely nuts, but Big Scott Norton puts an end to it. The NWO then regroup and Paige gets attacked, but the giant hits the ring and the New World Order decide to leave. Macho Man still wants to fight but he's held back. The commentators say that what happened tonight will not go unanswered. Paige is gonna pay for what he did to Savage. Rey Mysterio vs Yuji Yasuruka was up next. Yuji was a superstar from the Wrestle and Romance or Wrestle Association R promotion in Japan. And this, along with a match on WCW Saturday night the night prior, would be his only two televised appearances for WCW. Mysterio, being the established WCW star, gets all the adulation here. There's this great spot where Mysterio performs a somersault plancha over Mark Curtis and onto his opponent. Yasuruka counters a springboard attack with a jumping spinning wheel kick. There was this double arm DDT from Yuji that looked great, but predictably, Ray won the match with a West Coast pop. A lot of the match was spent on the mat too, which wasn't normally seen in cruiserweight matches. Of course, the cruiserweights do perform grounded submissions often, but normally they aren't locked in for very long. Yuji Yasuruka kept the submission holds locked in maybe a little longer than he should have, but really that's the only small complaint here. A decent match, but not must see. Alright, now it gets good. A Glacier vs Mortis rematch on pay per view. Vandenberg, Mortis, and Wrath stole Glacier's helmet, and Glacier wants it back. Glacier has been falling victim to his Mortal Kombat compadres, and it's been a blast watching this stuff on Nitro. It's so ridiculous that it's good, and besides, all three men here are pretty good in the ring, with Mortis being the standout, for me anyway. There's nothing I like to see more than old Frosty Balls getting his personal items stole while also getting beat up, so this for me is gonna be a delightful little match. Also, Fightful reported that Ray Lloyd, the man behind the Glacier gimmick, recently filed trademarks for Glacier paper goods. Stationary items such as pens, paper, desk calendars, picture cards, carry cases, things of that nature. Glacier is making a comeback lads in the form of office supplies. And I for one can't wait to buy my Glacier colouring pencils. I bet they arrive late and they don't work either. Anyway, Vandenberg says he and Mortis are gonna send Glacier back to his igloo tonight in a body bag. Glacier makes the mistake of rushing down and sliding into the ring, and Mortis takes advantage by beating the ever-loving shit out of Chili McFreeze in the corner. No kidding, Glacier gets decimated here with a ton of strikes as Mortis targets the knee and head. 
While Glacier dies a slow death in the corner, we see Wrath making his way down to the ring. Man, this is gonna be good. We are gonna see the end of Glacier tonight on pay per view, and this would have been worth the price of admission. But no, Glacier has magically healed and he performs an electric chair drop on Mortis, damn it. Glacier hits a clothesline and a back body drop before Mortis gets sent over the top rope, but thankfully Wrath gets in the ring and he breaks Mortis' staff over Glacier's back. Glacier wins via DQ, but I don't care. It's time for Glacier to pay for arriving late to WCW back in 1996. Two Cold Arse Holio gets choked out with the staff and Mortis lays in the strikes in the corner. Mortis drops Glacier on the steel steps with a kinda modified Famouser and it looked awesome. Vandenberg even gets in on the action and Glacier quite simply has no hope at all this time. Wrath goes for the death penalty and… Whoa, wait 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 wait, who the fuck is this? The commentators say it's a fan or uh, the police. This dude is ruining a very special moment for me by taking out Wrath and Mortis with some admittedly awesome karate kicks. Security come down and Tony Schiavone says, is that Ernest Miller? Dusty and Heenan say yeah, it's actually the real Ernest Miller, live and in person. But the problem here is, nobody knew who the fuck Ernest Miller was unless they followed karate or was a diehard kickboxing fan. Admit it, you didn't know who Ernest Miller was when this happened and the fact that the commentators expected people to know who it was is a joke in itself. Miller was a karate instructor around this time and he was teaching Eric Bischoff's son the deadly arts. Bischoff apparently asked Miller to come into WCW and show what he could do, and well, here he is, fucking saving Glacier. All joking aside, Ernest Miller would end up being a quite memorable character in WCW and he really wasn't bad in the ring at all and on the mic. Some may say he was even underrated, but we'll be seeing more of the cat on WCW Nitro very soon. He's a friend of Glacier, so he's no friend of mine. You ready to take care of some horseman business? You better be because Jeff Jarrett battles Dean Malenko next for the US Championship. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever way you want to look at it, Double J was unable to get the job done and the finish of this one brings us right back to around 4 weeks ago. It's one step forward and 10 steps back when it comes to the four horsemen in 1997. Those watching Reliving the War and following the series would remember for weeks upon weeks, Double J was having some problems with Big Mongo. McMichael because Deborah, Steve's wife, seemed to show Jeff a lot of support and this annoyed the former Chicago Bears defensive tackle. When Reggie White showed up in WCW to challenge Mongo, it looked like Double J and McMichael got on the same page and their repetitive and played out rivalry came to an end. Well, tonight at Slamboree, that rivalry started again and it's the same shit we have seen before. Jared bumps into Malenko and he falls out of the ring. Deborah checks on Jarrett and this is enough to make big Steve McMichael walk down the ramp and he tells Deborah to stay away from Jarrett. Mongo tells Jeff to do his job before throwing him back in the ring and Jarrett takes a double underhook powerbomb before submitting to the Texas Cloverleaf. As for the match itself, Dean clearly worked a style more suitable for Double J and I don't mean to be negative, but it was detrimental not only to the bout but also Dean's streak of incredible pay per view matches. This one was a lot slower and a lot more by the numbers than the other matches Malenko has had over the past lot of WCW pay per views, and that's a shame. Again, there's no real reason to watch this one. Next up we have a death match, Ming vs another horseman, Chris Benoit. No pinfalls, no countouts, no DQs, it's over when one man can't continue. This match stems from the Kevin Sullivan vs Chris Benoit rivalry. Sullivan is kinda using Ming as a henchman here in storyline, but in reality, Sullivan was preparing to step away from the ring and putting all focus on backstage work. Kevin has one more match in WCW and that one happens at Bash at the Beach in a few months time. Turns out Kevin wasn't too legit to quit after all. Sullivan's on screen character hasn't added much to WCW's programming and it was the right move to step away. There were too many big dogs in WCW, too many younger guys who could put on better matches. Sullivan didn't really have a place on TV with his most recent promos feeling like a waste of time and that's time that could have been spent on other guys. 
So Ming versus Benoit, this sounds like it should be good. Benoit and Ming cautiously try to attack each other at the start of the match and they also show caution when going for a lockup. Ming tries to take a shortcut during the second lockup and he kicks Benoit, but Benoit counters the second kick with a dragon screw. The third lockup ends with Ming hitting a belly to belly suplex. Ming lays in a few kicks and Chris Benoit gets stunned but the Crippler fires back with a German suplex. Both men take a moment before getting back to their feet. Meng goes for a big boot but Chris holds onto the ropes before hitting a low drop kick. But Meng kicks Benoit when Chris goes for a figure 4. On the outside of the ring Chris takes a hard slap but he answers by throwing Meng into the ring steps. It's all back and forth here and no one is gaining any kind of advantage. The match resets back inside the ropes and Meng brings Chris to the corner. You can see the sweat fly off Benoit's chest after a few hard chops, but Chris gives as good as he gets. This however just pisses Meng off and Chris gets annihilated afterwards. Jackie shows up and she stands at the entranceway. Woman approaches Jackie and she backs off. The commentators wonder why Jackie even decided to show up. Meng applies a half crab and Chris Benoit makes it to the ropes. This is a death match, so why Randy Anderson gave Ming a 5 count is anyone's guess. I know this kind of thing happens frequently in no disqualification matches, but I always hate it when it happens. Benoit takes a pile driver and the referee asks Chris if he wants to end it. Benoit gets back to his feet. He then manages to trap Ming's arm and we see the crossface. Ming makes it to the ropes and again Anderson gives a 5 count. Tony Schiavone rightfully says that Chris doesn't have to break the hold but Benoit releases his submission finisher. After recovering on the outside, Ming completely unloads on Benoit as woman screams on the outside. Randy begins a 10 count but Chris gets up and he goes right back down. Ming is unstoppable tonight. Chris again challenges Ming to come at him and this time it goes to the corner where Ming lays in the boots. Chris gets out and he starts throwing right hands before going for his three German suplexes but Ming counters the third with a few chops. Chris again traps the arm and we see another crippler crossface and we see another rope break. A suicide dive from Chris Benoit keeps Ming down on the outside. Chris goes for a top rope move back in the ring but Ming stops the horseman. Benoit then counters a slam and we see another German suplex while Ming was elevated a little on the bottom rope and now it's time for the diving headbutt. Chris goes up to finish the match off but Ming catches Chris on the landing and we see the Tongan death grip. Woman pleads for Chris to give it up while the crowd chant for Benoit but Chris shakes his head, he wants to see this one through. Ming brings it to the mat and it's over. Chris's body goes limp, he can't answer the referee so Ming wins the match. Ming heads back up the entranceway as woman and officials check on Chris. And I enjoyed this one quite a bit. It was hard hitting with some of the chops looking particularly brutal. Both men looked good throughout and I thought Ming getting the victory was unexpected. The Steiner brothers took on Conan and Hugh Morris next and this one was plucked out of thin air. No build up, no story, just a random tag team match featuring Rick and Scott Steiner and two members of the Dungeon of Doom. The Dungeon of Doom were getting slowly phased out too by the looks of things as Morris and Conan come out to different theme music. Also, some guy knocks Conan's hat off during the entrances, just thought I'd point that out. Scotty and Morris start this one off, Scott lands an arm drag and Morris complains about hair pulling. Steiner then applies a top wrist lock and when Morris slams Scott to the mat, Scott then complains about hair pulling. Morris hits a shoulder block and he tries to bring it to the corner but Scotty comes back with a belly to belly before applying a submission on the mat. Scott then tags in brother Rick and the dogface gremlins too busy barking and running around the ring. Morris catches Rick with a few right hands followed by a corner clothesline but once again Hugh Morris takes a suplex, this time it's an overhead belly to belly. Two Steiner lines followed by a diving Steiner lines enough to knock Morris out of the ring and the funny man has been out wrestled by the Steiner brothers. Conan tries his luck next but it's another Steiner line from Rick that keeps Conan in check. Rick gets in a belly to back before tagging Scott back in but a boot from the corner puts Scotty down. Scotty doesn't stay down for long though because we see another overhead belly to belly suplex. If you enjoy big suplexes then this is definitely the match for you. Morris comes back in and Jimmy hard trips up Scott. Morris then drops Scott on the top rope and the dungeon of doomers then begin quick tagging and double teaming. Both guys try to make Scott tap out by focusing on his left arm but Scott hangs in there. 
Morris misses a clothesline and we see one more belly to belly before Scott tags in Rick. Rick cleans house and the match breaks down. All four men are in the ring, Conan gets taken out, Morris misses the no laughing matter moonsault and we see the Frankensteiner from Scott. It's been a while since he's done that move and the crowd pops huge. Rick covers Morris and it's over, the Steiner brothers win at Slamboree. Conan looks pretty disappointed on the outside. He gets in the ring and he takes out Morris with a low dropkick and a DDT. He then pays no attention to Jimmy Hart afterwards, so yeah, as mentioned earlier, the Dungeon of Doom are falling apart and we should all be very, very happy. Reggie Wide of the Green Bay Packers showed up on Nitro a few weeks ago and it was announced that he would face Steve McMichael at Slamboree. This week on Nitro was the first time we saw Reggie get physical and you could instantly tell what kind of match we were in for at the pay per view. Whereas Kevin Green wasn't absolutely awful in the ring and while Mongo, well Mongo gets a pass because it's Mongo, Reggie White just didn't look all that good in the ropes but you know, much respect for getting in there on pay per view and giving it a shot, I'm sure the payoff made it worthwhile. You hope for something good here but common sense kicks in and you realise that this is gonna be bad. Steve McMichael is still learning himself so Reggie didn't have a ring general in there to go through the steps but I'm sure this match was rehearsed quite a lot before Slamboree. 15 minutes, 15 fucking minutes, tons and tons of time wasting to start us off, Reggie pushes Mongo into the corner after the initial lockup, Mongo comes back with a hammerlock and a push afterwards, and the two men then run into each other with shoulder blocks but neither man goes down. This results in both guys circling the ring again and wasting more time. Another side headlock, another shoulder block, more time wasting follows, fuck's sake Reggie let's see that dragon runner or a corkscrew moonsault and stop teasing us. Side headlock, shoulder block and… <laughs> okay that was good, you got me Mongo. Now it begins going downhill rapidly here and apparently the guys were told to hurry the match and go home early but because the match was worked out step by step and because Mongo and White weren't comfortable deviating from the script they decided to not listen to the order and they kept going and it was absolutely horrible. I'm not sure when they get the order but it does happen. Mongo draws the scrimmage line in the ring and this gives us more time wasting. Mongo then takes his opponent out while thinking he was very smart indeed but when we see the same spot again Reggie leapfrogs over Mongo and we see one of those top notch clotheslines. Jesus Christ. Mongo decides to leave the ring and head to the back but he's stopped by Reggie's teammate Gilbert Brown, nose tackle for the Packers. Reggie then hits a dropkick and honestly I've seen worse, it's not graceful or anything but I've definitely seen worse. <coughs> Rocky my <veil. coughs> More stalling, more walking around the ring, Mongo applies an arm bar that stays in way too long and Reggie gets out with uh, another one of these and I'm pretty sure afterwards is when Mark Curtis sends the message to Mongo to wrap the match up and go to the finish but that doesn't happen. Reggie instead applies another side headlock and Mongo forces a rope break before clipping the minister of defence. Mongo then twists away at Reggie's ankle and he does some damage to the leg but he also misses a leg drop. And I'm losing patience with this match, the crowd have even died down and the novelty of the match has definitely worn off. Another side headlock, this time it ends with a Reggie wide crossbody but Mongo kicks out of the follow up cover. And holy mother of god, Reggie white with a deadly nerve pinch, there's a spot available for this guy in the nation of domination. Mongo gets out with a low blow, he tells fans at home that he just heard the church bells ringing and Big Steve makes Reggie crawl to the bottom rope after locking in a half boston crab. I'm gonna breeze through the rest of this guys, trust me I'm doing you a favour. Reggie throws Mongo off the top rope, Reggie also hits an ok looking clothesline followed by an atomic drop that also looked fine. After a brief fight on the outside Reggie hits his splash in the middle of the ring but Deborah distracts the referee, Mongo grabs his magical briefcase, he gets it taken away by Gilbert but then Double J runs down with another briefcase and he tosses it to Mongo, this is like double doinks at Wrestlemania 9. Reggie gets whacked and Mongo wins the match. Why Double J would help Mongo after the US title match I have no idea, but the match ends with mercy and I'm sorry for putting you all through that. 
I'm not a big football guy, but I know Reggie was one of the greats. Certainly, he was a big name and a respected man in the sport. But he and Mongo put on one of the worst pay-per-view wrestling matches in WCW history here. A painful 15 minutes for wrestling fans, but in terms of marketing, it probably paid off. Eric Bischoff stated himself that if he had the option of going back and cancelling the match, he wouldn't do it. He actually would have done it again. Main event time, another WCW vs NWO battle. The original Wolfpack consisting of Scott Hall, Kevin Nash and Six taking on Roddy Piper, Ric Flair and another football player, Kevin Green. This one really started when Nash cut one of the best promos of his career, calling out old timers and legends of the business who left potholes in the road for the younger guys to travel on. Pushing the message that tradition bites, the young lions of the NWO were not only interested in filling the potholes, but they also wanted to wreck the tradition of WCW and bring in a new era. And to kickstart that new era, the legends of WCW and the old timers had to get taken out. This is Ric Flair's return match as mentioned earlier, but it's also Scott Hall's first televised match since returning to WCW from a stint in rehab. Roddy Piper's in here because he's been feuding with the NWO ever since showing up at Halloween Havoc 96. And Kevin Green must have had a few free dates and WCW decided to add him to the main event. He certainly doesn't fit in with the story Kevin Nash and the NWO were telling in the run up to Slamboree, but we are in North Carolina tonight, so he fits in as a babyface. This is also a no disqualification match as announced by Nash this week on Nitro. Piper was also attacked at the end of Nitro this past week by the NWO and he sold his hip. So it's likely that the injury is going to come into play during this six man tag. With all due respect to Flair and Piper, you can see why the NWO were so popular just by watching their entrance. They were much more fresh and much more cool as they made their way down to the ring, whereas Piper and Flair relied on their legacies. And rightfully so too, these guys are true wrestling legends and with Flair wrestling in Charlotte tonight, you can bet the fans would get behind the nature boy. They go absolutely nuts for his entrance, it's great to see. But the NWO really did represent a change in world championship wrestling, whether you want to admit that or not. Six said to Flair that he's nothing but a fraud who ripped off Buddy Rogers and the fans get excited when Flair and Six start the match off. We see a side headlock and a shoulder block for fuck's sake. But look at the difference here when two true pro wrestlers do the spot and they put a lot of snap into it. It looks great. Six gives Flair a wrestling lesson by performing a hip toss afterwards but he ends up taking a chop after doing the Flair strut. Flair pays with a ridiculous kick from Waltman and man, I said on Reliving the War that I wasn't really excited for this match but the crowd are great here and I'm already enjoying this. Maybe it's because I watched Mongo vs White beforehand though. Flair takes a few chops in the corner before delivering a few of his own, Six gets rocked with a back body drop and Rick starts nation in the ring and it gets Hall all fired up. Hall decides he's seen enough and he tries attacking the nature boy but Rick takes out Scott and Six. He then chops Big Nash and Nash doesn't go down, instead he looks at Flair like he just pissed in his cereal. I can't say this enough, the Carolina audience is absolutely brilliant here. Rick has him in the palm of his hand and the Wolfpack are playing along perfectly. Watch this match just to see the atmosphere in the arena. Big Sexy waits it out and Scott Hall gets tagged in. We see a little more styling and profiling and then Kevin Green of the North Carolina Panthers gets tagged in and it's another huge pop. Kevin's feeling it tonight, he's all excited and Scott Hall isn't quite sure what to make of this. So he spits on Green before tagging in the big man. Nash is the man who made this match mean something through the promos he cut on Nitro. People don't like giving Kevin Nash credit for anything it seems, but I'll give him all the credit in the world for doing the good mic work in the run up to this main event. Big Sexy and Green push each other around before Nash hits a knee strike and he brings Green to the corner, shouting how about that football boy in between elbow smashes. And here I'm just going to play the audio from the show here, listen to the crowd. Big Sexy gets back on his feet and Green pulls off a jumping clothesline. 
Green then nails Nash with a body slam, and Nash goes to the outside to set up a sneak attack. Only problem here is Kevin Green knowing an ambush when he sees one. Six and Hall get taken out and the NWO look like absolute chumps here. Kevin Green is having a lot of fun. The Wolfpack regroup on the outside and they change battle plan. Scott Hall gets in the ring and he calls out the Hot Rod. Piper gets in the ring. Hall makes fun of Roddy and he slaps his taped up leg and hip only to get slapped right back in the face. Scott's a little taken back but he goes for a lockup and he brings it to the corner where Piper turns it around and we see a ton of strikes from the Hot Rod. Piper then mocks Scott and Scott looks on as if to say, is that right motherfucker? And Scott tries to go after Roddy one more time but a knee lift sends the bad guy down. Hall looks at his corner and he says, that's it. Scott's gonna try and finish Roddy for good, and Piper gets brought to the NW corner for a beatdown, but the Hot Rod fights off every member of the Wolf Pack. Hall gets taken out with a swinging neckbreaker, but the NW get a chance to fight back when Six takes Piper out from behind. Piper is supposed to have an injured hip but the whole leg is being targeted. Hall mocks Flair who watches on from the apron and Scott goes for a figure 4 on Piper but the hot rod kicks Scott away. Roddy then goes to the wrong corner for a tag, I hope that was intentional. He then turns around and the nature boy gets tagged back into the match. The nature boy's adrenaline overflows as he takes out all three NWO members but Hall puts an end to that with a thumb to the eye, gets him every time. We see the corner bump, Flair rushes up to the other turnbuckles, but Hall catches Slick Rick and we see the fall away slam. Rick gets sent to the outside and when Roddy Piper tries to help his teammate, Six attacks him. This leads to Green running over for the save, but Nash ends up hitting Rick with a big boot when Randy Anderson sends the babyfaces back to their corner. Big Nash tags in and he hits snake eyes on Flair. Hall lends a hand from the outside to keep Nash in the driver's seat and there's a hush in the arena as Kevin lands a sidewalk slam. The NWO then take turns at punishing Flair with Hall hitting a corner clothesline and Six hitting a bronco buster, and the crowd lets Six know what they think of him as Flair continues to get destroyed. Rick then fights back and Six takes a forearm to the back. This didn't look too good and it's strange that they done the same spot again afterwards. Hall and Piper get tagged in but the referee does not see the babyface tag. Anderson tries to send Piper back to his corner but he gets punched instead. And then the match breaks down and everyone hits the ring for a brawl. Nick Patrick, the former NWO referee, comes out to check on Anderson and the ring clears out until we only have Hall and Flair inside the ropes. Flair gets the better of Scott but Nash hits Flair from the apron and Scott sets up the outsider's edge. Rick counters with a figure 4 while Kevin Green stops Nash from breaking the hold. Piper then locks in the sleeper on Big Sexy and Green takes out 6 with a running power slam. The outsiders are locked in submission moves with nowhere to go and no one to save them. Green pins 6, Hall's shoulders are also on the mat. Nick Patrick counts to 3 and it's all over. The babyfaces win and the crowd goes crazy. WCW just defeated the NWO at Slamboree. The heels are left laid out in the middle of the ring as Flair, Piper and Green walk back up the entranceway. And the show ends with the babyfaces celebrating and the crowd still going nuts. I'd forgotten how fun the Slamboree 1997 main event was, I'm sure many will disagree and I'm sure the reviews online bring up work rate and all that shit but I'd only ever seen this match once beforehand and I had a blast watching it again. I mentioned earlier that I wasn't looking forward to this main event and I was wrong to expect a poor showing here. It isn't a technical wonder but the crowd make it so much fun and everyone who worked the match played their role perfectly. A good main event that surprised me a lot. Regal vs Dragon I thought was fantastic too. If you only watch a few matches from this show, check out the opener and the main event. All in all, Slamboree 97 was decent, you have the Ming vs Benoit match too that's pretty fun to watch, the Steiners match wasn't bad neither and the rest, yeah you could skip it over, but in comparison to the World Wrestling Federation's Cold Day in Hell pay per view, I personally think that Slamboree 97 was a much better show from start to end. I do recommend you check out the main event though if you simply want a fun 6 man tag and also it's good for those who want to see how a hot crowd can make all the difference to a wrestling match. 
I hope you enjoyed watching Slamboree with me today and I hope you're having a great Christmas break too. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you all in the next episode of Reliving the War. The NWO won't take this defeat lightly so join me next week and we'll see how they retaliate.